sorry I don't love you A friends have grown accustomed to Cause with you something isn't wrong Something isn't wrong Something isn't right I wish you could be happy Welcome to Geekdom is back with our seventh episode, and as we mentioned last episode, this one is going to be all about Star Wars Rebels to follow up our Clone Wars episode, and I have Jacob Tenderon, who I believe last episode I called the Master of Knowledge for Star Wars. So That's definitely you, not you true. Now a, <laughs> you now have a name to live up to, Jacob. I'm sorry. <laughs> How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for having me back. No problem. And of course, thank you for coming on to talk about Rebels, because out of all of my Star Wars friends I have, I think you and I might be the only ones actually caught up on Rebels. So I was like, all right, got to have Jacob on for this one, because I don't know who else is still watching this. I am mostly caught up. I didn't see last Saturday's, but uh, I, I am caught up otherwise, and I'm excited about it. It's getting really good. Yeah, and this is, you know... 14 years after the fall of the Galactic Republic and the Jedi Order, which happens in Revenge of the Sith. And, you know, Clone Wars obviously takes place way before this as well. We've seen some characters from Clone Wars show up in Rebels. Do you think that continuity sort of helps fans move from one show to the next since you know, Clone Wars ended in 2014 with a final series or final season going up on Netflix. And then Rebels right. pretty much started that same year and it's now mm -hmm. in its third season. So do you think sort of keeping a few little aspects of the Clone Wars in on Rebels helped that transition kind of for the viewers? Uh, I think Clone Wars was like a, a very beloved show. I mean, I loved yes. it. It was getting better and better over time, and the characters were just getting so much, you know, deeper. You know, you're, you were learning so much more about them. So right. obviously, we had some really great story arcs with Ahsoka, who has made her way into Rebels. Um, she's been a really big part of that. Uh, you know, even Captain Rex and some of the the clones that survived the Clone Wars in Order sixty six. They, uh, you know, they've made their way into the show as well. So. Yeah, I mean, as far as like Clone Wars characters go and, you know, original trilogy characters too, you know, we're getting a little bit of Tarkin and, um, you know, some of the some of the more sinister folks that we're going to have to be dealing with here in, in movies like Rogue One and then eventually Episode 4. Uh, I think all those tie-ins help bring in a wide array of people. I think a lot of kids will watch Star Wars Rebels anyway because it's an animated TV show that their parents will put on for them, but... You know, as far as getting older folks like me and, you know, even older folks watching Star Wars Rebels, I think it takes a bit of, I don't know, maybe fan service uh, or throw, you know, just callbacks to, to stuff that's, that they're familiar with to actually, you know, um, entice them and get them watching. Yeah, and I know you and I have both been pretty much engrossed with the new Star Wars canon, you know, reading the books, the comics. I don't know how many of the comics you've read, but I know, you know, you've ordered a bunch of them and I've just been keeping up on Marvel Unlimited so I'm a little behind since that is six months behind mm -hmm. but I feel like a lot of this stuff has been so enjoyable and ties in really well together because you know in Rebels we have Kanan and then he has his comic book series mm -hmm. that has been out too and it's like you're seeing these characters in so many different formats and Ahsoka just had her own book come out, which I know you read and so I good. Yeah, it was really good. not read yet, but in Clone Wars, Ahsoka easily became one of my favorite characters from that series. And mm -hmm. even though, you know, I did things backwards, I watched Rebels, started watching Rebels first and then went back and watched Clone Wars because, you know, yourself and other friends were like, you have to watch it. It's so great. And I think not really understanding necessarily who she was in Rebels the first time I saw her was strange, but then going back and watching Clone Wars, it's like a lot more stuff in Rebels made sense, even though it's not the exact same characters. They're just mm -hmm. bringing over these little tidbits from Clone Wars, and it's like, you know, having Dave Filoni on both shows, I think, is really what has 
made Rebels become such a popular show. I know it might not be as popular as Clone Wars or as beloved as Clone Wars, but it's still fun to watch. And I think, you know, the first season might have started off a little rocky just because of how abruptly Clone Wars ended and they didn't really get to finish what they had started with that final season. But I think, you know, season two and even now the handful of episodes we have in season three, I think it's really, you know, hit its stride and it's going to keep getting better. Oh, yeah, definitely. I think it's getting solid in the way that Clone Wars started getting solid around season three. Um, You start getting into a little bit heavier subject matter. You know, the stakes are higher. Um, You are getting a lot more character depth and you know, like you said, there's a ton of tie-ins right now. So there are four Star Wars Rebel books, all written by Jason Fry, which are all really good, easy, short reads. Um, those follow a character named Zara Leonis, who was in, I believe he was in season one when uh, when Ezra infiltrated the Academy to, um, you know, find some Force users and get them out. Um, and then, you know, there's there's a ton of books. Like you said, Ahsoka, that recently came out. That was really good. Um, there's A New Dawn, which is like a prequel to star wars rebels so that's a good place to start if you want to get to know a little bit more about kanan and hera um and then you know even like lords of the sith that tells the story of cham sandula who is ezra's or sorry hera's father right and he makes his appearance uh a couple times now in star wars rebels which is really neat so there's you know the the universe is expanding and we get a lot more stories and we get to see where everybody exactly fits in and and how you know all these interactions actually come to pass there's a lot of history to cover between the events of episode three and episode four so you know rebels and a lot of these expanded universe sort of novels they're um they're really filling in the gaps in a really cool way yeah and you know with season one it felt like I wouldn't say all set up, but a lot of it was that sort of, you know, getting to know these characters, really getting to know Ezra since I wouldn't necessarily say he's like the star of the show, but he's definitely, you know, a focal point in the show. Mm -hmm. And it's just so interesting how they give all of these characters, you know, their own little moments because we don't see every character in every single episode Mm -hmm. you know like we had a full episode just on you know chopper getting a new leg practically Uh yeah (laughs) and (laughs) while it's not you know crucial to the storyline it's kind of fun and nice to have little moments like that where you know chopper seems to have so much personality even though you know people like you and I have no clue what he's actually saying and we need the characters to translate for us. But it's just these nice little moments that they manage to squeeze in in the, you know, midst of all of these crazy things that are happening with the rebellion. Right. Yeah, I think I think you're right about that. They they do a really great job of like tying a bunch of different episodes together but still keeping them uh, sort of individual to a point, so you get to know certain characters more. So, you know, I, my girlfriend and I really like Bob's Burgers, so when we watch that episode, we're immediately looking for, okay, whose episode is this going to be? Is this a Bob episode? Is this a Gene episode? Is this Louise episode? Because each episode f- focuses on a main character. All the characters are generally involved, but the story is usually saying something about one of the individuals rather than the whole and you know just within the past couple episodes here you know we started with one with Ezra which is is pretty common but since then we've had one that's all about Hera we've had one that's all about Rex even and you know it's it's really interesting to get uh, all those perspectives because all these characters are really cool individually and you know they're they're making this band of, of rebels here that are working collectively to do something bigger but individually they all have really interesting stories and Um, I think the writing on this season in particular has been really great. I'm really, really excited about where the story's going. Yeah, and that Rex episode you mentioned, it was the last battle. So it was, I believe, the last episode you watched as well. And, you know, they run into this super tactical droid Mm -hmm. and a little, you know, old Clone War army of droids that, Mm -hmm. you know, Rex had spent so many years facing off against and i thought that was a very interesting episode because you know like i mentioned they're doing all of these little things to kind of 
look back to Clone Wars and bring something from that here. And I feel like this episode was basically, you know, like the epitome of that because you literally have all of these droids that were such a huge part in Clone Wars. And even, you know, Rex and Ezra and Kanan, they were like, what are these doing here, basically? And, you know, in the end, Ezra gets them to kind of put aside their differences and realize, you know, neither of them really won. And they both kind of have a common enemy. And seeing something like that, especially when you're trying to appeal to droids who have been programmed to basically think one way and one way only, it was ju just like a cool episode that didn't really have any bearing on what happened to the rebellion per se. Yeah, I love that bit at the end of that episode with Ezra, you know, kind of making peace with everybody because he points out a really good thing that they're both fighting tyranny. Of course, you know, they the the Separatist army was trying to keep the Republic from, you know, gaining control over the galaxy, absolute control. Right. And, you know, they they kind of failed in that way because, you know, the empire took over. And uh so in, in that way, you can kind of deduce that they both have a common enemy and that they're both trying to fight tyranny. And in that way, they're allies. So it was cool to see them team up in that way. And obviously Rex, um, I didn't expect that Rex would get that much of a feature in the show. You know, I, I thought right. at first it would just be kind of like a one-off, you know, kind of fan service moment to the people that really love Star Wars Rebel or Clone Wars. But, uh, you know, he's been featured more and more heavily all the time, which is really cool. Yeah, and I think... It's nice because he sort of brings that experience with him because it seems like a lot of people in the rebellion, they're not experienced in these huge wars that, you know, happen like the Clone Wars. And I think it's just really cool that they brought him specifically in. And, you know, like you mentioned, Ahsoka, who hasn't been in it too much, but, you know, she's been in it enough to, you know, get the moments you really wanted and expected from her character mm -hmm. especially with how you know season two ended and just in case anyone isn't caught up we won't give away too many details on that because that is a big moment you know it's not something like rex having his own episode but i think they're doing a lot of great fan service with rebels even though it's never going to really necessarily be what the clone wars were two fans you don't think so i mean i i think it kind of depends because like you said a lot of people really really loved clone wars and i've seen a lot of people not necessarily a lot of people but some people are a little more hesitant with rebels because i don't know if it's because it's you know on some children's channel like disney xd or whatnot and i know clone mm -hmm. clone wars before was on cartoon network but Disney XD feels like it has a lot more of the cheesier shows, especially the live action shows that they do. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's something that is pushing people away from this show or not. But to me, I think, you know, I know you and I think it's a great show and it definitely has a lot of potential still moving forward. So I think it's more of a matter of whether or not they can keep this show on the air, which they unfortunately weren't able to do with Clone Wars and finish it out. Because, it, you know, if it ends after, say, this season, I feel like we'll still be left with a lot of unanswered questions. Well, I think that's the nature of it. I mean, I think the Clone Wars was the same way. I didn't pick up on Clone Wars until a couple of seasons in, you know? So I, I right. think, I, I think honestly, Rebels is moving to deeper territory faster than Clone Wars did. Obviously, Clone Wars takes place over a very short period of time, and they just kind of draw it out with a bunch of different battles. Um, which right. makes it really interesting. But Rebels has already, you know, taken place over a couple of years in just three seasons. I think each season technically takes place within one year. So I think it's it's been like two or three years at this point in the story. And, uh, yeah. you know, I, that's foretold by uh, Ezra's new haircut, which is a little more on the crew cut side. But, um, yeah, <laughs> I, I think... I think it has a ton of potential and I don't know, you know, what the statistics are for those that are watching it. I imagine that they're somewhere on par. Otherwise it wouldn't um, probably continue, but 
I'm I'm not sure what's gonna what's gonna happen with this show. I hope that it goes for another couple seasons. It's hard to say, you know, how close they they're coming up pretty close to the events of episode four. You know, they're they're leading into the bigger rebellion and uh, you know the conflicts that we're gonna actually see on film, and it's hard to say if this will be able to continue in any meaningful way longer than maybe another season or two you know so what do you think do you think that they'll be able to to keep this going a little longer are we getting close to the end like what what do you think's going on yeah i i think they will be able to keep this going just because you know as we've seen with you know episode seven and rogue one it's kind of like there's always going to be a rebellion so i feel like just naming it star wars rebels gives them more leeway For that, because, you know, the Clone Wars was specific to the Clone Wars. And it's like, if you kind of got outside of that, it's like, okay, what's the point of this show Mm -hmm. being named Clone Wars? So I think they gave themselves a little more leeway there, just alone with the title of the show. And, you know, like you mentioned, this is moving at a much faster pace. And I don't know if that's because they want to get through as many big points as possible before, you know they either reach the end of their story that they wanted to hit Mm -hmm. or before it goes off air. But I think, you know, it's been a while since I've watched like cartoons on a regular basis, you know, like watching everything on Cartoon Network like I used to when I was actually a kid. Yeah, of course. But to me, I think Cartoon Network seems like a much bigger network than say like Disney XD because I know Disney XD is not the main Disney channel Mm -hmm. so I'm wondering if the fact that this is you know like a secondary Disney channel it might be able to keep a run going longer because I know obviously we have this show on that channel and I think a lot of the Marvel animated shows are also on Disney XD Mm -hmm. so I think they're kind of you know gearing all of these like comic book and Star Wars and you know, these animated shows to Disney XD Mm -hmm. as sort of a, I don't really want to call it a secondary thought for, for Disney, but Disney has so much stuff going on that it's like, you can't have just one Disney channel anyway. So I think this is sort of going to be where they put a bunch of the Marvel stuff and, you know, any Lucasfilm animation stuff that goes on. So I'm hoping that if that's their plan, then these shows will stay on air longer Mm -hmm. than something on, you know, Cartoon Network would, because Cartoon Network, obviously, you know, Scooby-Doo is probably still a really big show for kids (laughs) or something like that. And that's, as far as I know, that's always been on Cartoon Network. And, you know, I know when I was a kid, they were still airing the Scooby-Doo episodes from like the 60s when it originally came out. Oh, yeah. So I, I don't know, you know, I haven't, kept up with all of the different new Scooby-Doo's they've had, but I know there have been quite a few. So I'm hoping with the fact that this channel seems more focused on these animated series Mm -hmm. than Disney's, you know, like live TV, live action TV shows. I'm hoping that this will kind of stay for at least a few more seasons because I feel like there's always just so much that you can cover with the rebellion. Mm-hmm. It doesn't necessarily need to stay between episodes three and four. You can still fill in these little, you know, side storylines that weren't covered in the movies. And, you know, when I did the episode on Clone Wars, we were talking about how that sort of did a much better job of portraying Anakin than the prequels ever did. And I think with straight animation you have a lot more freedom because you don't have to be like okay we have these live action actors and actresses and we have to cgi all of this and it's like it's just straight animation so i Mm -hmm. feel like they can focus more on the actual storylines than how it's going to you know come across in a movie or what have you that we've you know seen with rogue one like you know they had to do reshoots and whatnot which is pretty standard for probably any movie let alone you know like the superhero movies and the fantasy movies and all of these things that require a lot of cgi and stuff to begin with but Mm -hmm. i do think you know the show has potential to go beyond just this set time period that we're in right now i think that's interesting I, i i would be open to that idea it was it's just like once you get to you know the events of say even rogue one or episode four um you've got 
all of these characters that we know and love within this rebellion, and then are we just supposed to, you know, imagine that the characters that are currently in this program are just, you know, not involved on the big screen? You know what I mean? Like, you could do tie-ins with, right. the, with the big screen characters in the animated TV show, but, you know, you're not going to see them in the big movies, so the tie-in won't be as strong. Like, it would be one thing if, yeah. you know, the, the old dude on uh the moon of endor was actually captain rex like people seem to think he is but you know that's that's not proven at any point the, a tie-in like that would be cool but you know what do you do for harris and doula like the only twi'leks that we see in the original trilogy are the ones dancing in jabba's palace i mean you know it's, right yeah it's, it, it would be hard to tie a lot of those characters in so personally i would be totally fine if they all got killed off I'm totally cool with it because I think that adds a little more weight to the thing. And like, if they're, if they're able to tie the story in that way, I think that'd be interesting. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what the story group comes up with that for, or comes up with for that, because obviously they spend a lot of time on rebels. It's an ongoing TV show and they, you know, it's, it doesn't seem like an afterthought to me. It seems like they actually put a lot of uh, thought into the story and how it ties in with other works to, you know, to fill in gaps and, um, I'm I'm excited for it. I'm excited to see what Dave Filoni and his team actually do. Uh, it should be cool. Yeah, and I mean, in Rogue One, you know, Forrest Whitaker's character, I mentioned this last episode, or Bobby mentioned it, mm-hmm. actually. He's Saul Guerrero, mm-hmm. or Guerrero, and he was a character in a little s- episode series in Clone Wars. So they're even still tying Clone Wars into the current movies. Mm-hmm. So... And, you know, Saul wasn't a huge character by any means. You know, he was just in probably three or four episodes. And I think, you know, they can still find ways to tie Rebels to the movies. And they don't necessarily need to use, you know, characters like Ezra or Kanan or Hera or Sabine. And they can use some of the secondary characters from Rebels, like they've clearly done with Clone Wars, and pull them into the movies and you'll still sort of get that feeling Mm -hmm. of a tie-in but it won't be you know all of the main characters going from the animated series to the movies necessarily right no that's a good point that's a good point they could do something like that i know obviously there are fewer seasons of rebels right now than there were of clone wars in its entirety but what do you think has been your sort of favorite thing about rebels is it the characters they've brought to the screen or do you think it's the fact that they've brought in these little pieces of the clone wars and kind of sprinkled it in for the fans who watch that show Mm -hmm. is there anything in particular that's your favorite thing or do you just like star wars so much that it kind of (laughs) is the thing as a whole for you oh man good question uh i mean i i'll watch and read anything star wars obviously but i really as far as rebels goes um i really like that they're bringing Ahsoka back into it uh, or that, you know, that she's been brought back into it and her story has been told a little more uh, before the novel is announced. You know, we weren't sure if we were going to get anything more of Ahsoka's story. Um, I'm glad that we did. Uh, I'm also glad to see Darth Maul return. I think Darth Maul has like a really interesting story. Um, His arc has gone over uh, a huge period of time, a lot longer than I would have expected. You know, as a kid, I thought Darth Maul was the coolest bad guy in Star Wars. And a lot of people didn't agree with me after, you know, just seeing him in that first movie, which historically hasn't gone down that well, uh, hasn't really stood up to the test of time, so to speak. But I think that Maul was an interesting character in itself. He was very mysterious in the first one. Uh, There was really no backstory to him. Uh, That backstory was given to him later in a comic book series and then again in the Clone Wars. Um, And the fact that they've been brought him back into rebels is really cool um i'm hoping that they can finish off his arc in a meaningful way because uh you know he's he's a very tragic character he's not uh simply a bad guy he's not you know just the sith trying to destroy jedi he has his own motives um and i think that personal story of his has been one of my favorite to watch throughout all of the animated tv shows yeah and you know do you think they will bring even more of these characters over from the clone wars like do you think we will ever get jar jar binks <laughs> <laughs> appearing somewhere in rebels oh man 
I don't know. <laughs> Jar, Jar Jar would be the one that they might, but um, I don't think that Dave Filoni is as attached to Jar Jar as he is Ahsoka. Right. So. <laughs> no, I, I don't honestly, think I don't think anyone so. is as attached to Jar Jar as they are Ahsoka. <laughs> I think that could have happened in season one. Uh, you know, Droids in Distress, that first episode, that was obviously like a huge fan service moment and sort of silly where you just have C-3PO and R2-D2 and like it's supposed to be lighthearted and fun. I could see them doing something with Jar Jar in that way, but uh, no, no, I don't I don't see him being in the story any further. Yeah, and what do you think of the whole Inquisitor storyline that they had going mostly in season two, I would say, but do you think that's something that we'll see keep coming back sort of like how general grievous kept coming back in clone wars to still try and defeat the jedi and whatnot do you think these inquisitors will just keep reappearing in you know trying to defeat kanan and ezra in different ways well there's a ton of inquisitors and i still love the idea of them i think that they're really they are still very mysterious um the origin of the the inquisitors hasn't been told as far as i'm aware you know even in ahsoka um they you know allude to the fact that these are unknown creatures they're literally they're they're described as gray beings like they don't have a species name um they are all apparently the same so uh you know the the grand inquisitor got a little bit of backstory in rebels mm, season two towards the end of season two i think but uh you know they're they're like essentially padawans of darth vader but like where did they come from how you know where where are their powers you know where how are they trained when were they trained there's so much that i don't know about the inquisitors that i'm naturally intrigued um that said like you know being so many of them it's sort of the story kind of gets a little old when you just keep throwing a bunch of new inquisitors their way but i haven't there i haven't seen so many in the show that it's obnoxious. You know what I mean? So, I mean, I think in the show there's, there's only been three, three or four. I don't know. Um, yeah. And three, I might be ones. wrong on this. Yeah. I might be wrong on this, but was the seventh sister, one of the inquisitors yes. and then she went back. Okay. Yeah. She's, a, she's a, she's an inquisitor. Um, they're all like, okay. they're all like brother or sister. Like, and I think, I think in Ahsoka, the sixth brother was in Ahsoka. Um, I don't know how many brothers and sisters there are, but <laughs> there seem to be quite a few. Yeah, because back in season two, we had this episode solely focusing around the seventh sister. And then, you know, they had the fifth brother and this guy was just like ginormous and practically could not be beat because he was so huge. And I think, you know, that was as deep as we got into the Inquisitors, but it still didn't really answer, you know, like you said, all of these questions of where do they really come from? And, you know, it's like we just saw the seventh sister really kind of struggling with sort of who she was, if she wanted to stay loyal to them or loyal to, you know, Darth Vader. And it was definitely an interesting look into that. And it's another one of those episodes where it doesn't necessarily need to focus solely on the rebels or it doesn't need to focus on the whole team. Mm -hmm. You can sort of go off on these little... I don't want to call them tangents because, you know, something like the Seven Sister storyline is still important to the story, but you can go off on these little side trips, basically, and kind of, you know, go visit someone else's world for an episode or two and then come back to the team. And it doesn't really feel like you've missed out on this huge thing in that time period. Yeah. Do you, what, do you, like, hmm. What do you think of of some of the other new bad guys in the show? Like, uh, you know, for example, Grand Admiral Thrawn is officially canonized as of this year. So that's that's kind of an exciting right. thing for a lot of people who read the Expanded Universe. What do you think about him? What do you think that's going to mean for the Ghost team? You know, I think when we saw him in the episode that focused all around Hera and her dad, mm-hmm. I think, you know, that was one of those really great moments in the show where it's like you can just see the evil forming in this guy every second that he's on the screen and i think they do such a good job especially now with thrawn building up to these bad guys in rebels and 
you know, it's similar to what they did with General Grievous in Clone Wars. It's like, it felt like every time we saw General Grievous, he had like another arm with another lightsaber, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know? So I think they're going to sort of slowly build up these characters especially like Thrawn because you know like we've mentioned we don't see every character in every episode and obviously in the Clone Wars we had a little bit of a different feel because they were at war so it's like they actively needed to be fighting almost every fighting someone almost every episode or saving someone every episode and here we just have a rebellion and it's like they're kind of trying to figure out everything as they go so you don't only have the fighting aspect you have to have you know i think in this show a lot more of the strategy aspect as well Mm -hmm. because this is something that they're not necessarily prepared for whereas the clone wars you know they had thousands or millions of clones that they could just have start fighting right i think a lot more thought sort of I wouldn't say a lot more thought because obviously a lot of thought went into the Clone Wars, but how they plan out these bad guys and enemies of the Rebellion, I think they have to sort of do that a little more carefully because, you know, we've seen Agent Callus in a lot of these episodes yeah. too. And it's like he doesn't really he doesn't really seem to do much. It's like <laughs> he's kind of just there and like go attack them you know sort of thing but thrawn is a character that feels like he's going to have this sort of master plan and he wants to be that guy whereas agent callus is kind of just doing as he's told Mm -hmm. so i feel like they've done a great job even with only you know thrawn being in what a couple of episodes so far yes he's such an intriguing character that it's like we want to see more of him already Yeah, well, you know, Thrawn's known to be very cunning and very tactical, so I think he showed that in the the episode that you're referring to about Hera, because, you know, he essentially essentially lets them go, because this isn't the time. Like, he's he's studying them. He's going for the long game, which is something that Callus and some of the other officers that we've seen in Rebels so far haven't been able to do. They're all very adamant about taking down the Ghost Team because they're causing so much trouble, but they're not really doing their research. They're not looking right. at the bigger I think picture. they just make, yeah, they just make more brash decisions. They're like, okay, there they are. Go get them. <laughs> like right. not even worrying about what the rebellion has or, you know, who they have on board. And, you know, mm-hmm. they don't plan anything out. It's just like, you know, they run into each other and it's like a shootout basically. And who can get away as quickly as possible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's seen, that's, that's kind of the fun of it. I mean, like that's that's more or right. less like any kind of you know kitty TV show. Like obviously the bad guys are supposed to get foiled by those meddling kids every single time. You know, it's it's a uh, it's something different that we're seeing with Thrawn. Obviously, he's a lot more calculated, and we'll see exactly what happens because I you know if the ending that I envision comes to light, he will be the end of the Ghost Crew. Like I think that that Thrawn is. Um, revered enough by the fans of star wars and perhaps even the story group themselves that uh they wouldn't let him be defeated so easily i think he's gonna he's gonna claim at least one major victory before the end of this thing no matter what happens right and you know with the rebels they're starting to actually get more characters and more people involved in the rebellion because a few episodes ago we had wedge and tilly's I believe I'm saying that right. I hope so. (laughs) And, you know, it's like these are names people sort of recognize just from either the movies or, you know, reading the books and whatnot. And I think this is probably a good way of them trying to get these names that people recognize that can tie into these future movies we have coming out. And while we don't necessarily need to keep, you know, Kanan, Ezra, Hera, Sabine, Zeb, and Chopper around in the Star Wars Rebels universe, like you said, you would be fine if they all got killed off. But then we are still getting these secondary characters that can tie in down the road. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I love the Wedge tie-in. We talked about that a little bit on Star Wars, or on Bantha Fighter, I think, uh, a couple weeks ago. Because, um, you know, Antilles is... He's a hero that we don't know much about, 
Like in the movies, right. he he's there for the major points of the film. You know, he he helps take down the Death Star for God's sake, but we don't know yeah. much about the guy. You know, he's an action figure and all, but what's his story? And it's cool to see that he was a defector. I think that makes a really compelling story. Um, you know, Sabine was the same way, so naturally she was the one that was like sent to to help rescue him. And if you uh, if you read the Star Wars Rebel books, there's um, there's some familiar stories in there as well. So it's kind of a good tie in. Uh, I I love that they're able to bring in characters now from the original trilogy that we didn't get much about. Uh, it gives me right. hope for future expanded universe stories, um, whether they be in TV shows or books or comics. Um, there's a lot of lesser known creatures and characters in the original trilogy that we just don't know much about, and we've spent decades pouring over and you know creating stories and then. Uh, creating new stories and you know just trying to dig up as much as we can from scraps of notes and illustrations from Ralph McQuarrie just trying to figure out as much about these no line background characters that are in these movies and I think it's great that we're able to like watch and read and hear these stories about you know nobody's like I, I, I could see at some point there being another collection of short stories about uh, you know, creatures from the cantina. Like there's, there's right. a book that recently came out. It's like a compilation, um, you know, about like uh, the aliens or like creatures great and small or something. I, I can't remember the exact title, but um, yeah, it's just about a bunch of the, the people and the creatures that we see in Maz Kanata's cantina. And, you know, why couldn't we do the same thing for the one on tattooing? I could totally see like a hammerhead story or something about Panda Baba. So I, I love the idea that all of that is fair game and that, you know, even if you're a minor character, you could, you know, like Saw Gerrera, you could get put into something a little bigger later on. Yeah. And it's funny that you bring up the sort of doing, you know, these little books on the creatures and everything. It's very similar to what Harry Potter has done, obviously, with Fantastic Beasts and where to find them. And oh, yeah. Yeah. more so what J.K. Rowling has done, because, you know, that's going to be five movies in itself. And it takes place, I think think on the harry potter episode we did recently it takes place 70 years before you know we get into harry potter at hogwarts and everything Mm -hmm. so that's a good chunk of time that you have to explore all of these other characters that really didn't get that kind of attention Mm -hmm. in harry potter because you know we had harry hermione and ron and they were kind of the core three Mm -hmm. and then everyone else was just like in their world (laughs) you know so yeah i think with star wars Just the fact that there's so many different planets and so many different, you know, species and creatures and whatnot, you could go so far with this series. And I think even, you know, just when George Lucas created this for the first trilogy, I don't know if he really knew how far this thing would go. And, Mm -hmm. you know, we have this entire world built around Star Wars. And I think things like this and Harry Potter do so well because it's obviously not real, but it still feels relatable in a way. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, people grow up with these series and people grow up with them at completely different times in their lives. You know, some people grew up with the first trilogy. Some people grew up with the prequels. And then now we have kids growing up with these great animated series. And it's like, you have so many different time periods covered for this world that it sort of gives everyone something to fall in love with. Yeah. Yeah. I th- that's the great thing. I think that's why it's an accessible saga. Um, and especially with as many, many mediums as there are now, even if you're somebody that doesn't like to sit down and rewatch a science fiction movie a thousand times, um, right. You know, watching it once might be enough. And then, you know, you might still have an interest enough to maybe pick up a book that you can read on the train. Um, and just to get a little bit more of a feel of, you know, a character that you saw in the movies. So it's definitely really accessible these days. And I'm really grateful for that. I think it's really cool to fill up a shelf full of Star Wars stories that I can pick up and read at any time. Yeah. And, you know, then for people like you and me, who kind of like all of these mediums for it, it's like, you know, we'll watch the movies, we'll watch the shows, we'll read the books, we'll even read the comic books, Mm -hmm. which Marvel has been doing a great job with. And, It's just, there's so much to consume. It's like, we could spend all day just consuming Star Wars stuff and nothing else. And, 
that would still, you know, not get finished anytime soon. <laughs> oh, I know. Tell me about it. I've been going through the novels a lot more quickly lately, but I still have quite a few left to read. Dark Disciple being one of them. I, that was like the first one that came out and I still have yet to pick that up and actually read the book. Yeah, I've read that one and I read Lords of Sith, Lords of the Sith that you mentioned, mm-hmm. Aftermath, Lost Stars. So I ha- probably haven't read nearly as many as you have, but I've been picking them up here and there. Like I do have the Force Awakens novel version and then yeah. I have what is it Battlefront Twilight Company or something yep and then you know I just actually picked up a book on the first trilogy for 10 cents <laughs> so I was like well <laughs> it's Star Wars and it's 10 cents I can't not get this <laughs> even though I know what happens from the movies <laughs> and you know it's definitely interesting to get to read all of these sort of expansions on these single characters like you know we have a book on Tarkin Mm -hmm. and a book on Ahsoka Mm -hmm. and thankfully my local libraries have quite a few of these in the you know new Star Wars canon Mm -hmm. so I've slowly but surely been sort of making my way through them and I'm hoping you know they get these newer ones soon and I think you know with Rebels too it's like we got a whole comic series on Kanan. Yeah. And I don't think, you know, when the first trilogy came out, you know, anyone could have ever dreamed of it being this big. Mm. And, you know, with, you know, Disney, Marvel and Lucasfilm kind of all being wrapped into one, I think that's really what helped get this series as expanded as it is now. Yeah, I think there's, I mean, the, just the fact that the that the story group has expanded to the point where, um, you know, they have people that are there specifically to work with authors and to help them take their right. ideas and craft them into stories that fit within the universe. So there are no, you know, there are no conflicting facts. Um, everything is cohesive and it actually makes sense. And that's ridiculously unique in the world of geekdom. You know, like there's there's no other series that is like that. Uh, You know, even in Marvel, of course, there are a thousand Spider-Man storylines and none of them fit together. They're all different and they're all just different interpretations of a singular character. But what Star Wars has that nothing else has is that that unique and like cohesive timeline that won't be messed with. And after, you know, expelling the expanded universe and, you know, legitimizing canon, uh, it's it's better than ever to be a fan of star Wars because you can pick up at any point and find something that you think is interesting and then find something related to that and just follow that all the way down the rabbit hole until, you know, you've, you've caught up and that's really hard to do. And as somebody who is constantly reading star Wars books when he has the time, I, I can attest to that fact. It's, it's very, very hard to catch up, but it's, it's not impossible. So, you know, start today. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And you know, with, rebels and clone wars it's like these two things happen in very different time periods obviously and it doesn't really matter that we got clone wars and then rebels started right after because like you said there's this timeline and you know star wars fans understand the timeline enough to not need to get it all you know in chronological order Mm -hmm. and you know now that there's this canon timeline obviously there's a lot of you know, the older books and stuff that aren't necessarily canon anymore. Like I know personally, I have Darth Maul shadow hunter sitting on my bookshelf and I haven't read it yet. And that's because right now I'm so engulfed in the canon stuff that it's like, I kind of don't want to, you know, get this probably slightly different picture of Darth Maul, yeah. especially with him being in rebels right now. And it's like, all right, so that one's going to sit at the back of the shelf <laughs> right now. <laughs> no, I'm with you. And... I, I've got a ton of legends books. I have, I picked up yeah. um, in one day. I went to two stores. They're actually side by side in Cleveland. There's a, this amazing toy store called the big fun toy store. And they have a huge nice. section that has like, you know, tons of old, old vintage star Wars toys. Um, and then they have some bookshelves and I happened to find like, maybe three or four of the old X-Wing novels. And then I went next door to a bookstore and they had the exact ones that the toy store didn't have. So I picked up the entire saga uh, with the exception of the first one, which I already owned uh, all in one day. So I thought that was like, that was kind of cool. I'm like, okay, I think I'm meant to read these books, but at the same time, it's like, (laughs) 
can I read these? Can you know? Can I read the Bounty right. Hunter series? Can I read Splinter of the Mind's Eye? Can I read uh, the original books by Timothy Zahn about you know Thrawn, like the Thrawn trilogy? I I would love to. I'd love to see where you know the people that are writing Star Wars books now maybe drew inspiration from because they are pulling in things from the expanded universe and making them canon. But uh, at the same time, like I I like to know the full complete canonized story. And until I've officially caught up on those, and I'm not far off, I, I think I'm going to let those sit and gather dust for a little while longer. Yeah, I have a very messy note card that's been sitting on my desk forever. That's just a list of the Star Wars canon books. And, I, you know, I have like check marks next to the ones that are at the libraries. I have, you know, notes on which ones I've bought mm-hmm. and which ones, you know, have ebook copies through the <laughs> library or, and stuff like that. And it's just like a disaster of a note card right now. But I've just still been keeping it on my desk because it's like an everyday reminder that, hey, you know, you want to read these. <laughs> but, you know, as you know, I'm always like, okay. I'll watch Clone Wars and I did watch Clone Wars, but it's like I have so many things that, you know, I've especially told you. It's like, okay, yeah, I'll read that. I'll watch that. And it's just like by the time I get through making my list of things I want to read or watch Mm -hmm. or what have you, it's just like, oh, my goodness, it's a good thing I don't like it's a good thing I don't have a job because I can do all of this stuff. But it's a bad thing I don't have a job because then I don't have you know, money coming in. So. <laughs> well, if you're into yeah. reading the ebooks, I think I can help you there. Okay. I, I will let you know. I think <laughs> I have quite a few of them. Yeah. But I think, you know, some of the newer stuff I don't have, you know. We'll talk. We'll talk after this is over. Right, right, right. <laughs> so. But to bring it back to Rebels real quick before we wrap this up, we're five or six episodes into season three right now or seven episodes i'm sorry because the first episode was technically an hour so it was technically two episodes but you know we're seven episodes in and eight episodes by the time you guys probably hear this and there's still so much that they can cover do you think season three is the season where you want to see them sort of wrap up this specific storyline and like you mentioned possibly kill off all of the main (laughs) team and then Would you want to see Rebels sort of continue with these secondary characters in any way? You know, like we have Wedge and Tilly's who obviously you want to know more about, but it's like, is that something you would like to see in Rebels or would you prefer to see that in the movies? Because I think, you know, the thing with these animated shows is we can get so much more information out of these Mm -hmm. than we can, you know, rogue one because that's going to be roughly two hours i'm assuming give or take Mm -hmm. on either side of that and you know with clone wars bobby and i mentioned that it was like 30 something hours of tv basically (laughs) and it's just crazy how you don't think of it in that way necessarily when you're watching rebels or clone wars week to week But then when you sit down and binge watch it, you're like, wow, I just got literally this entire piece of the picture Mm -hmm. right here. And it's like, I didn't have to wait for it. You know, it's like we got episode seven, obviously, but it's like we're waiting two years to kind of see what happens with Luke. And it's like that is such an excruciatingly long wait that I feel like these TV shows kind of give us something to distract us in the meantime. So would you like to see them kind of branch off and hit some of these stories that you wouldn't necessarily want to wait to happen in the movies? Um, I'm totally fine with the trajectory that they're going. I think that this season will end out with, you know, a bang like it usually does. Uh, I hope that they can, I mean, personally, I would love to see them finish off Maul's storyline in the season, but I don't think that's right. going to happen. I think that's going to have to wait a little bit longer. Um, I don't know. I They've they've really been focusing a lot on Ezra and Sabine this season. I get the feeling that something is going to be happening with Sabine. So I don't know. I, I don't think that they're going to kill the entire squad off. I think that maybe right. it, there's a possibility that one of them could leave the show in some way. Um, yeah. I don't know. It's hard to say. I don't I don't want to speculate because I, I like getting surprised week to week. I'm actually finally on a week to week schedule with Rebels. I binge watched enti- the entire season two after just falling too far behind. So I'm caught up. I'm actually going to be watching season five when we or episode five of season three when 
we get off this call. So I don't know. Personally, I I'm totally fine with what they're doing. They they can keep making stuff. I'm I'm not really one to ask for things because I'm interested in all of it. So uh, you know, unless somebody decides to make a you know a comic book about Ponda Baba specifically, I'm not going to make any requests. Yeah, and you know, even the comic books are sort of branching off and doing these secondary characters. Like it was just announced that Doctor Afra mm-hmm. is going to have her own series after being you know kind of vader's helper in the darth vader series and it's just you know like we said there's so much they can do with all of these that it's kind of hard to say what you want to happen with rebels necessarily because you're like well they could go all of these different directions and i'm kind of fine with all of them you know and whether or not we see ahsoka again anytime soon you know that's for them to decide Mm -hmm. and i think if that does happen a lot of people will be thrilled with it and if it doesn't it'll kind of still keep that question there as we go on because you know obviously in clone wars ahsoka left the jedi order and you know then it's like all of a sudden we see her in rebels and there's still you know this sort of huge gap to fill in on you know where she went what did she do and that sort of thing and i know you mentioned the book that was all about her was good and does that sort of fill in any of that or does it just kind of give you more of ahsoka in general it takes place shortly after order 66 uh so you kind of catch up with ahsoka she's been sort of hiding out and on the run um for a while they don't know that i i guess the empire doesn't know that she's alive um at least at least not at the start of the book. Uh, um, but then, you know, it, it kind of ties it into her uh, coming into the rebellion it's, itself on a, on a greater scale. It's a good story. It's not like, uh, you know, I, I tweeted this the other day. I don't think it's like the most pressing moment in Ahsoka's story, but I think it, right. I think it's critical if you're interested in knowing like where she's coming from and what exactly, uh, you know, she, she's doing in the greater story like i think it's you need to read this story if you want to know um you know her motivations but behind like continuing the fight because you know she could have easily just withdrawn and and hit out somewhere but she ended up you know she gets she gets drawn back in in a way i think i can say that much and uh i think if you're interested in ahsoka's story this would be a good one for you well, I know what is next on my reading list now. I will have to hope, you know, libraries have that soon or something. I know they, you know, already got in Aftermath Life Debt pretty shortly after it came out. So I think... Yeah, still got to read that. Libraries are pretty good about getting, like, the new stuff that people are really into. Because it's like, you know, you'll see all the Star Wars books. You'll st- see all the Stephen King books. And, you know, like, these big books that everyone wants to read. Uh-huh. But, you know, you mentioned there are books that tie in directly with the rebels storyline which books are those just so you know we can link to them and people can check them out i know i mean a new dawn i have not read a new dawn but it it does follow the story of kanan and hera so i mean if you're interested in those characters that that's a good place to start um ahsoka obviously has its has its tie-ins uh then i guess lords of the sith would probably be the next biggest tie-in because of right. Cham and then Tarkin, he's you know he's in Rebels as well. Uh, I think they all tie in, in in a way, um, but those are the ones that take place uh, more or less around the same time period as Rebels. Awesome. And do you have any final thoughts on Rebels that you want to get out before we wrap this up? Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm soaked to to finish this season. I, we've got another four or so episodes left, I think um, five, including the one I haven't watched today. So. I'm excited to see where it goes. Uh, obviously, I, I I think that they're going to leave it off with some. I th- I really do think that they're they're going to leave it off with uh you know some big sort of cliffhanger. Um, that's not like a <laughs> that's not a wild guess by any stretch of the imagination. But um, the tone of this show has definitely been getting a little darker. I think that something big yeah. is about to happen. I think Thrawn is going to have a really big hand in that. So I'm excited to see what plays out. Yeah, and I know on the list of episodes, there are four left, and only two of them have air dates right now. So we definitely have stuff coming, you know, towards the end of November, and then we'll see if they sort of take a break for the holidays and pick up again in January, or if they squeeze them in before Christmas, you know, Mm -hmm. but 
this season they only have 11 episodes listed as opposed to you know like i think season two was 22 episodes if you count the season closer as two episodes since it was an hour Mm -hmm. but it's interesting to me that this is so fewer than that was so it's like okay, what are they going to wrap up this season and what are they going to do either if the season gets extended to 20, 22 episodes or if they just start season four with the start of next year. That'll definitely be interesting to see. But like you, I'm excited to see where this goes. And I think I definitely have this show to thank and you know, you and others for telling me to go back and watch Clone Wars because I don't think if I hadn't started watching Rebels, I would have really been interested in the animated shows in general Mm -hmm. and you know going from rebels and going back to clone wars obviously it it was backwards first of all but it's like i think rebels started i it didn't really start off too rocky but it's like i think with the first season a lot of people had questions about how this show would do and everything and you know, once I went back and watched Clone Wars, I was like, okay, you know, I really want to watch Rebel, continue watching Rebels because I want to see what they do that ties in with Clone Wars and how they play this out. Especially, like you said, with Darth Maul returning and, you know, Ahsoka coming back and, you know, some of these characters. I think, you know, there's there's just so many things you can do when it comes to Star Wars that no matter what they do, it will probably be good even if it's not exactly what some fans were hoping for Mm -hmm. yeah i i think uh it's a good show if you're interested in star wars and you've made it this far into it i think you could probably digest it uh in the time that we've been talking you could have watched two entire episodes of the show so (laughs) possibly three possibly three (laughs) so put that into context uh, when you're when you're watching Yes. Well, thanks so much, Jacob, for coming on. I know, you know, you have Bantha Fodder, which is your own Star Wars podcast. So I didn't want to step on your toes too much here, but I know you were caught up. So I think you and Mike can still find something to talk about for Rebels if this season finishes out before you guys do that. So if he ever if he ever starts watching the show, I don't he hasn't even begun Rebels yet. He's still working through the Clone Wars. So it's uh, OK. Yeah. yeah. Totally so fine. you have time. You have time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you again for having me on. Uh, I really appreciate it. It's fun. No problem. And to our listeners, thank you guys for listening and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Cheers. <laughs>